War and Peace, Book Ten, Chapter Twenty Four, Recording for LibriVox.org by Eva Harnick. On that bright evening of August twenty-five, Prince Andrew lay leaning on his elbow in a broken-down shed in the village of Knyaskovo, at the further end of his regiment's encampment. Through a gap in the broken wall he could see, beside the wooden fence, a row of thirty-year-old birches with their lower branches lopped off, a field on which shocks of oats were standing, and some bushes near which rose the smoke of campfires, the soldiers' kitchens. Narrow and burdensome and useless to anyone as his life now seemed to him, Prince Andrew, on the eve of battle, felt agitated and irritable, as he had done seven years before at Austerlitz. He had received and given the orders for next day's battle, and had nothing more to do. But his thoughts, the simplest, clearest, and therefore most terrible thoughts, would give him no peace. He knew that tomorrow's battle would be the most terrible of all he had taken part in, and, for the first time in his life, the possibility of death presented itself to him not in relation to any worldly matter, or with reference to its effect on others, but simply in relation to himself, to his own soul, vividly, plainly, terribly, and almost as a certainty. And from the height of this perception, all that had previously tormented and preoccupied him suddenly became illumined by a cold white light without shadows, without perspective, without distinction of outline. All life appeared to him like magic lantern pictures at which he had long been gazing by artificial light through a glass. Now he suddenly saw those badly daubed pictures in clear daylight and without a glass. Yes, yes, there they are, those false images that agitated and raptured and tormented me, said he to himself, passing in review the principal pictures of the magic lantern of life and regarding them now in the cold white daylight of his clear perception of death. There they are, those rudely painted figures that once seemed splendid and mysterious. Glory, the good of society, love of a woman, the fatherland itself. How important these pictures appeared to me, with what profound meaning they seemed to be filled. And it is all so simple. Pale and crude in the cold white light of this morning, which I feel is dawning for me, the three great sorrows of his life held his attention in particular. His love for a woman, his father's death, and the French invasion which had overrun half Russia. Love, that little girl, who seemed to me brimming over with mystic forces. Yes, indeed, I loved her. I made romantic plans of love and happiness with her. Oh, what a boy I was, he said aloud bitterly. Ah, oh, me! I believed in some ideal love which was to keep her faithful to me for the whole year of my absence. Like the gentle dove in the fable, she was to pine apart from me. But it was much simpler, really. It was all very simple and horrible. When my father built Bald Hills, he thought the place was his, his land, his heir, his peasants. But Napoleon came and swept him aside, unconscious of his existence, as he might brush a chip from his path, 
and his bald hills, and his whole life fell to pieces. Princess Mary says it is a trial sent from above. What is the trial for, when he is not here, and will never return? He is not here. For whom, then, is the trial intended? The fatherland, the destruction of Moscow. And tomorrow I shall be killed, perhaps not even by a Frenchman, but by one of our own men, by a soldier discharging a musket, close to my ear, as one of them did yesterday. And the French will come, and take me by head and heels, and fling me into a hole, that I may not stink under their noses. And new conditions of life will arise, which will seem quite ordinary to others, and about which I shall know nothing. I shall not exist. He looked at the row of birches shining in the sunshine with their motionless green and yellow foliage and white bark. To die, to be killed tomorrow, that I should not exist, that all this should still be, but no me. And the birches, with their light and shade, the curly clouds, the smoke of the campfires, and all that was around him changed and seemed terrible and menacing. A cold shiver ran down his spine. He rose quickly, went out of the shed, and began to walk about. After he had returned, voices were heard outside the shed. Who's that? he cried. The red-nosed Captain Timokin formerly Dolokhov's squadron commander, but now, from lack of officers, a battalion commander, shyly entered the shed, followed by an adjutant and the regimental paymaster. Prince Andrew rose hastily, listened to the business they had come about, gave them some further instruction, and was about to dismiss them when he heard a familiar lisping voice behind the shed. Devil take it, said the voice of a man stumbling over something. Prince Andrew looked out of the shed and saw Pierre, who had tripped over a pole on the ground and had nearly fallen coming his way. It was unpleasant to Prince Andrew to meet people of his own set in general, and Pierre specially, for he reminded him of all the painful moments of his last visit to Moscow. You? What a surprise, said he. What brings you here? This is unexpected. As he said this, his eyes and face expressed more than coldness. They expressed hostility, which Pierre noticed at once. He had approached the shed full of animation, but on seeing Prince Andrew's face, he felt constrained and ill at ease. I have come simply, you know, come. It interests me, said Pierre, who had so often that day senselessly repeated that word interesting. I wish to see the battle. Oh, yes, and what do the Masonic brothers say about war? How would they stop it? said Prince Andrew sarcastically. Well, and how is Moscow? And my people? Have they reached Moscow at last? he asked seriously. Yes, they have. Julie Drubetskaya told me so. I went to see them, but missed them. They have gone to your estate near Moscow. End of chapter 24 Recording by Eva Harnick, Pontevedra, Florida